Hello. I'd like to welcome you to this First Presbyterian Church of Pilot Mountain online worship service for today, September 13th, 2020. A few uh, announcements that need to be made. Tuesday evening Bible study has resumed. Uh, there should be an email out that has a Zoom connection if you would like to join us at 7.30 on Tuesday evening. We are studying 2 Corinthians. If you have any questions, you can contact me and I will do my best to get that connection to you. Uh, for this month, Pilot Outreach is looking for canned beans and the basket will be in the front door next to the office uh, for the collection there. If you would please join me in our call to worship as we gather together. People of God, bless the Lord. Bless God's holy name. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love for us. Scripture tells us if we say that we have no sin, then we are found to be lying and God is not with us. So let us join together and confess our sins to God and to each other in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you live for us, we have not lived for you. You have forgiven us, we have not forgiven others. You have loved us, we have not loved ourselves, nor have we loved one another. Take pity on us and forgive us, God. Help us to forgive. Help us to live for you. Help us to love through Christ our Lord. Amen. People of God, our sins are forgiven. God is merciful and gracious and is Lord of all. Reconciled to the God who loves us, let us live and love through Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. And if you would join me in our unison prayer for illumination. Holy God, your word is strong and leads our feet to your holy dwelling place. Strengthen and guide us with your word through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. And from Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak only eat vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their minds. Let those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in the honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God while those who abstain abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. 
So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment of the seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. And our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And he, as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy? on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you. And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay the entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was in high school and college, my worst subject was any math course that I took. I could never quite get what was going on with the numbers. And when I took higher math courses, well, I was more confused. I had issues that seemed to make it hard for me to understand what was going on in those classes. So you can imagine what it was like for me to see that there are a number of numbers in the text for today. It was an arithmophobe's worst nightmare. But in those numbers is a lesson of forgiveness that I had never equated. The math of forgiveness is more than one can imagine. Before we get into the text for today, let us step back and take a look again at what is being taught in the first part of this chapter. Jesus has been teaching his disciples a few matters that needed to be dealt with. The first is, who among them will be greatest in the kingdom? In response, Jesus takes a child and says, you must become like this little child. Jesus is saying to the disciples that they are to be obedient, teachable, and humble to be part of the kingdom. One must approach the kingdom as a child or as a lost lamb as the shepherd goes out, finds, and brings back to the fold. And then second, Jesus tells them how to deal with a member of the congregation that is sinning against another. Not just an accidental sin, but premeditated sin. Think embezzlement or something that requires some planning. Jesus tells the disciples there to confront the person privately and then escalate to two or three witnesses. Then, if there is no repentance, finally bringing them to the congregation where they may be separated from the congregation. This is not to be, meant to be a sign of the limits of forgiveness or compassion, but rather a chance for the person to realize the seriousness of the sin and hopefully be brought back and experience forgiveness. Which leads us to today's reading. Most of us, if we have been in church any amount of time, have heard this parable. In fact, we are, if we are honest, most of us, when we hear it, might just begin tuning it out. When we do this, we miss what is a rich and valuable text. 
So let's step back and take a look at what is being taught here. In light of the previous teaching, Peter asks how many times to forgive someone who has done him wrong. Seven times? When Peter believes he is being generous, rabbis thought that three times was the max when it came to forgiving something very serious. So seven times would have been twice as many as what was usually allowed. Now let's step back from the text for just a moment and think about Peter's question. As I said, Peter believed he was being very generous by asking us seven times. Think about how many times we have forgiven someone who has done us wrong, and then maybe we will realize the radical nature of Peter's question. Jesus' reply would have shocked Peter and those hearing the message in those days, not seven times, but 490, or 77 according to some sources, times. Does this mean we're to keep a logbook of who we forgive and how many times we do? No. Jesus is saying we should forgive to the point that one loses count. To keep track is not to forgive, but rather to check when we can officially lose patience with a person. To illustrate the point, Jesus tells a story. And Jesus could tell a very good story. He would have the audience in, on the edge of their seats and give a twist that would leave them breathless and their heads spinning. But they would get the point. Today, sometimes we miss the point because we might not understand the culture of the original audience. Or, again, we may have heard it so often that the stories become old hat. In any case, let us examine a few of the details that come from this story and hopefully the story will become more clear. There's a king who's calling in his accounts, checking the books and making things sure, making things, making sure that things are all nice and balanced. But he finds that one, official, or one slave, really a higher official, who was likely to be in charge of revenue in the province where the official was, has well skimmed a little off the top and owes 10,000 talents. Now a talent was the highest amount of money in the Roman world and 10,000 was the highest denomination. In fact, the word used here is myriad, which means innumerable. The annual tribute paid to Rome from Galilee was only two to six hundred talents a year. So what was owed was more than the amount that would have been sent over a 15 year period. There is no way the official is going to be able to pay this back, and the king knows this. So what to do? Well, the official and his family and all his possessions will have to be sold, which shows that he had nothing left to pay back this amount. And what they will have to do is be sold into slavery. And even then, that would just bring back a little bit of the amount. And at this announcement, the official throws himself at the feet of the king and begs for mercy, saying, all will be paid. The king, knowing that this is clearly impossible, has compassion and in the outrageous math of forgiveness, forgives the loan. And notice he changes it from embezzlement to a loan. All well and good. But the official turns around and comes upon a minor official who owes him a hundred denarii, which, while it may take some time, is a debt that is payable. Here is where the math really comes to the forefront. One denarius was the usual wage for a laborer. It took 6,000 denarii to equal one talent. A talent would equal about 20 years of work for a laborer in the fields. The amount owed by the first official would have been the wages for 200,000 years work for a person, or the wages for a year of 200,000 people, roughly the population of Winston-Salem. The amount owed by the second official is about the amount of four months labor, it would take some work, but it could be paid off in time. In fact, the ratio of the two debts is 600,000 to 1. Truly, this is a sounding difference between the two amounts, and one would think that the forgiven would look upon the debtor with compassion. But the forgiven official, caring nothing about the forgiveness he has just experienced, grabs a minor official by the throat so he cannot get away and demands payment now. The one who owed ten, 100 denarii pleads with the higher official and says the exact same thing. Give me more time. I will pay it back. But the forgiven will not forgive, and he has the one with the smaller debt thrown into prison until that debt is paid.
probably through a ransom. The king hears of this and brings the forgiven official in, saying to him, You were forgiven much, and you could not forgive a little? The debt owed by you will then be paid back at, to the very last penny, even if we have to literally take it out of your hide. And so it will be if you do not forgive from your hearts, says Jesus, mostly to a, likely to a wide-eyed audience. So, what is forgiveness and why should we do it? The dictionary defines forgiveness as to give up resentment of or claim of requital as in, for, as in forgiving an insult, or to grant relief from payment as, if, as in to forgive a debt, or to cease or feel resentment against an offender, pardon as in forgive one's enemies. And there are two words in the New Testament that are translated to forgiveness. Karzomai, or charity, to deal graciously with, and ephemi, to send away, to loosen. And ephemi is the word found in the Lord's Prayer as well as in Matthew 18.21. So why forgive? Forgiveness changes us and releases us from the hatred and bearing the weight of grudges. Not forgiving can go in cycles. A daughter does not forgive an abusive father. Her daughter will not forgive a wayward son. The daughter's son will not forgive an ex-wife after a marriage goes sour. And though different relationships within a family, what they all have in common is that they will not forgive. If only one would break the link that links them in this line, healing could begin and steps made toward wholeness. And here are a couple examples of breaking the cycle. One prisoner of war asks another, Have you forgiven your captors yet? I will never do that, the second one answered. Then they still have you in prison, don't they? The first one replied. And Rabbi Harold Kushner tells this story about why we need to forgive. He says, a woman in my congregation comes to see me. She is a single mother, divorced, working to support herself and three young children. She says to me, since my husband walked out on us, every month is a struggle to pay our bills. I have to tell my kids we have no money to go to the movies while he's living it up with his new wife in another state. How can you tell me to forgive him? I answer her. I'm not asking you to forgive him because what he did was acceptable. It wasn't. It was mean and selfish. I'm asking you to forgive because he doesn't deserve the power to live in your head and turn you into a bitter, angry woman. I'd like to see him out of your life emotionally as completely as he is out of it physically, but you keep holding on to him. You're not hurting him by holding on to that resentment, but you're hurting yourself. And even more than the psychological arguments for forgiveness, as Christians we must also consider the spiritual reasons for forgiveness. We should forgive because Jesus told us to do so, and because we have been forgiven. Like the first official, we have been forgiven a debt that we could never repay. If we do not forgive, then we show that we are incapable of receiving forgiveness from God. But you may say, you don't know what that person did to me. And you would be right, I really don't know what pain and hurt may have been inflicted. But I do know that we are not to hold grudges, to hold on to the feelings of resentment that can lead to rage and can lead to bitterness which makes us just as bad as the official who was forgiven but did not forgive. But you may also ask, what about the persons who for we forgive who hurt us again? Here we see the distinction between forgiveness and reconciliation. We are not called to be doormats, and there are times when no reconciliation occurs, but forgiveness must still come. Here are a few things forgiveness is not, based on Lewis Mead's book, Forgive and Forget. Forgiveness is not, one, forgetting. You may be sincere in your forgiveness, but you do not have to forget. This could apply to abused spouses and children, those who are taken advantage of by shady business transactions, etc. Two, excusing. You can hold people accountable, not excuse them, and still forgive. And we use this all the time with the five-year-old at home. There are still consequences for hitting someone, even when they forgive you. 3. Smothering conflict. When one smothers conflict and people's differences, 
then we rob the others the chance to forgive. Four, accepting people. This is not the same as accepting people for who they are. You forgive those who have done something unacceptable to you. And five, tolerance. You may forgive people, but you can still not approve of what they have done. A final question many will ask would be, well, what about those who don't deserve forgiveness? One more story, please. Corey Tim Boom spent several years in Ravensbrück concentration camp for helping and hiding Jews in her home in the Netherlands. After her release, she wrote the classic book, The Hiding Place, and traveled telling her story and about the grace of God in her life and in others. At one stop, she was approached by a man who said he needed to ask her for forgiveness. He had been a guard at the camp and had asked God for forgiveness and was now a Christian. He wanted her forgiveness for his crimes to her and her family. He knew that he could not make up for what was done, but he was truly sorry for the things that he had done. Tim Boom was furious. Of course she knew who this man was and what right did he have to ask for forgiveness. She did not say this out loud, but thought it. And then a voice said to her, And how much have you been forgiven? And she knew then that she must forgive this man who is now a brother in Christ, which she did, freeing him and herself from the burden they both carried. The math of forgiveness is outrageous. It just does not add up. The debits do not equal the credits, as my accountant wife would say. We were forgiven so much by God when we could not pay back what we owed, even if we tried. Yet we who have been forgiven much are many times unwilling to forgive someone who needs so little forgiveness. And yes, sometimes there is no repentance and therefore no reconciliation. But we are called to forgive regardless. When we, as the saying goes, bury the hatchet and forgive, we are not to leave the handle sticking out of the ground. For then we have not forgiven with our hearts, but are just waiting for the right time to pull it back and out and strike, forgetting that we have, are forgiven ourselves. We show ourselves to be like the first official who was incapable of receiving the forgiveness given to him because he would not forgive. No, when we forgive, we are to do so with our whole heart, lay down the burden and no longer carry the weight on our shoulders. It is no longer ours to bear. We have been forgiven and given a new life. Should we not go and do the same? Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. So let us state together what we believe in the, faith, in the statement of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we go now to the prayers of the people, I ask that you turn to page 6 of your bulletin and look over the prayer list that we have. And let us now go to God in prayer. O oh God, your unfailing love has been the source of our strength. It has led us through troubled waters and away from our enemies. In your infinite love, you have had pity on us and heard our cries. Because of your faithful love and mercy, we bring our concerns to you, O oh God. For the universal church, that it would be an instrument of your love, forgiveness, and grace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the global community, that we would learn to live for each other in peace and cooperation and share collective responsibility. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our local community, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
For those who suffer in their minds, bodies, or souls, wrap your arms around them and in love and help us, the church, to be what they need. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the silent intentions we hold in our hearts, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to Jesus Christ the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the charge. Walk in the strength and confidence that God guides your feet. Therefore, live for God, show mercy, and love one another. And may the God who protects and defends keep you in safety, mercy, and love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.